Okay. Uh, uh, today's uh, number 16 Mark School. And uh, today the subject is feminism. So I will ask uh, Amali Vedakedra to moderate today's session. Amali, it's for you. It's over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, Professor Titi Bhattacharya. She is the professor of South Asian history, uh, also the director of global studies at Purdue University. She is the author of The Sentinels of Culture, Class, Education, and the Colonial Intellectual in Bengal, published by Oxford University Press in 2005. She edited Social Reproduction Theory, Remapping Class, Recentering Oppression, published by the Pluto Press in 2017, and also a co author of Feminism for the 99 Manifesto, which we will be uh, focusing on today. She is a longtime activist for Palestinian justice. She writes extensively on Marxist theory, gender, and politics of Islamophobia. Professor Bhattacharya has also contributed to the public education by disseminating her ideas through a range of popular publications in The Guardian, Monthly Review, Jacobin, and New Left Review. She edits the social reproduction series at the Pluto Press with Susan Ferguson and on the is also on the editorial board of the Spectra, a Marxist journal and another journal studies on Asia. Women are subjected to multiple forms of violence and discrimination as capitalism rages on across markets and conquers the household as a realm of capitalist exploitation. And women are also resisting as we see in Sri Lanka, South Asia, and across the world by being at the forefront of political movements against uh, these violations of capitalism. Today, Professor Bhattacharya will speak more on the urgency for feminist politics from the perspective of the 99% to explore for anti-capitalist anti possibilities. Over to you, Professor Bhattacharya. Hey, uh, thanks so much, Amali. And uh, thank you to the Mark School for inviting me. Um, I know it's um, evening there, but it's early here. So um, I'm still going to be drinking my tea as I as I talk to you. Um, so thank you very much. I am I agreed to speak today, not so much as Amali's very, very generous um, introduction uh, outlined to kind of disseminate my ideas, but I s uh, agree to speak more because I want to know about the feminist movement in Sri Lanka. You know, I that's really why <coughs> I, I agreed to speak because Hello. I would love to know the kind of work that um, feminists are doing in Sri Lanka. Uh, you know, I read as much as I can about feminism in South Asia, but it is a real honor and a privilege to connect to actual activists on the ground. So I hope this is more of a conversation uh, than me just talking at you about um, uh, feminism because I have much to learn. From, from you. So I think what, I, I don't know if you have read the book, uh, Feminism for the 99%. Um, I thought at first that I would uh, read a, a little bit from the book, like, um, you know, the few um, introductory uh, phrases. But then I thought, well, you know, maybe I should just talk my way through it. And then if, if necessary, I, I'm happy to read from the book. So I wanna start a little bit about talking about sort of my journey into feminism uh, from um, it, what, what shaped it and how I got to where I am right now, right? So my journey to feminism is actually a bit curious 
I come from a left family in uh, India and had become a part of the organized left uh, by the time I was 17. Uh, this was, you know, in the 80s and early 90s. But uh, while I thought myself to be a Marxist and a radical and many variations of such epithets, I never thought of myself consciously as a feminist. As a Marxist and radical activist, I of course fought for women's liberation, wrote about women's liberation, campaigned on many issues that would be considered feminist. But I, however, never called myself a feminist. I call myself a Marxist, you know, a radical and so on. This all changed to a certain extent with the birth of my daughter. That is the moment when I began to insist on being called not just a Marxist, but a Marxist feminist. And this new word was important. Pregnancy, childbirth, and the first few years, I want to say five years of caregiving, turned me in one fell swoop from an active, energetic, sexually desiring woman to a perpetually tired, anxious, body conscious mother. I don't know if comrades uh, are familiar with Adrienne Rich's writing. She is a poet, uh, you know, uh, a, a queer uh, feminist poet who uh, is a great supporter for Palestine, uh, died recently. But she has a wonderful um, book called um, Of Woman Born. And that kind of saved me reading Adrian Rich's writing. It saved me during that time by distinguishing between being a mother, which I enjoyed greatly, and the institution of motherhood, which I absolutely viscerally hated. So this new word feminist alerted me in new ways. It connected me to histories and stories I had always defended but never perhaps felt such a skin kinship to. This book, uh, Feminism for the 99%, and I am particularly proud of this book, um, much more so than my other sort of academic books and publications, um, because uh, this book was co-written with co-comrade, uh, with very, very close comrades. And was the result of my work as a national organizer for the International Women's Strike in 2017. And the reason I start with the movement and not the book is because the book is not so much about learning about feminism as it is about doing feminism. So what is feminism for the 99%? Well, as comrades know, Hillary Clinton and Sheryl Sandberg in the US, or Smita Godridge and the Baikon chief Kiran Majumdar Shore in India, have been the headlining symbols of feminist power. But if feminism is limited to those who arrive in limousines and designer clothes, then it is just about power, power that the few hold over the many. Feminism for the 99% then is about reclaiming feminism for the many, for those who labor from those who benefit from that labor. And right now, the United States, the country where I live and work right now, um, as you know, it's, it's a very wonderful thing that uh, Trump has been defeated in the elections, um, but, Joe Biden, who is the incoming uh, president of the United States, is really, um, really advertising and, and highlighting the fact that his cabinet is going to be filled with women and um, racialized people, right? So um, right now, uh, the, the head of CIA, Gina Haspel, is a woman. Gina Haspel, by the way, was... Um, was personally responsible for torture, and this is publicly uh, acknowledged. Um, and it, right now, in the United States, 
uh, three out of the five leading arms manufacturer companies are actually headed by women. Okay, so this, you know, uh, the the and as you know, uh, the vice president of the most violent imperialist state that is the United States is now a woman of color, and um, you know, Kamala Harris, and you know, of South Asian descent. So this is a version of feminism that has been the handmaiden of capitalism for decades of neoliberalism, right? That we were told that feminism is about empowerment of women. And what that really translated to was the empowerment of ruling class women, of um, women who, uh, wanted to compete with ruling class men to get their jobs, right? So that was this version of, of feminism has been uh, uh, the dominant version for the last 40 years of, of um, uh, neoliberal um, dominance in, in the capitalist world. And so this kind of feminism actually narrowed the meaning of feminism to mean formal equality with men, right? So the, the conversation has always been, what does feminism mean? Well, we want to be equal to, to men. But equality is a very tricky term, which can indicate equality in prosperity or equality of misery. So today, 30% of South Asia lives on less than $1.90 a day, and nearly 60% lack the means to, basic, uh, to meet basic needs. In this ravaged world of capitalist um, predation, equality is a meaningless concept if it simply implies that women should aspire to earn the same $1.90 a day as men. So why do we then need a feminism for the 99%? Liberal feminism has not just narrowed the definition of feminism, it has actually constricted the range of issues that can be counted as feminist. Consider the issue of a woman's right to abortion. We of course fight for the legal right to abortion and co consequently to include such a right as a leading women's issue, and so we should. But a legal right is again, a formal right, a necessary but insufficient condition for women's emancipation. The legal right to abortion is not enough if access to abortion is determined by wealth and power. A poor woman may know she has that legal right, but if healthcare is privatized and beyond her reach or simply inaccessible, if the cost of abortion far exceeds her financial means, then what good is the law besides ticking a woman's rights box? If abortion is a feminist issue, then so is free healthcare, which will allow everyone irrespective of social status to access abortion. The right to abortion similarly must be complemented by the right to have children. What does that mean? So for feminists for the 99%, this means demanding the right to a strong public healthcare system to birth our children, to a fully funded public education system for our children to go to school, to affordable public housing for our families to live safe lives, and most of all for safe neighborhoods, indeed countries, to bring up that child free of communal cost and otherwise police violence. For us, feminism then is that thread that will lead us out of the monstrosity that is capitalism to a society where equality and freedom are organizing principles not aspirations. So how do we do this feminism for the 99%? Uh, you know, as I speak today, yesterday, you saw the sort of power of feminism for the 99%, which was um, Argentina. Um, Argentinian feminists have been fighting for 
uh, you know, a, a decade nearly now uh, for um, legalization of abortion rights. And there was a very powerful movement two years ago, and it got defeated in, in the House. And the movement did not let off, did not go off the streets. In fact, uh, simply deepened the social movement um, for abortion. And yesterday, uh, we all saw that the lower house of the Argentinian parliament finally ratified in, in the, the right to, to abortion. So consider some of the most powerful social movements of recent years, and you will see that they have been women-led. Uh, Argentina saw the beginning of Ni Una Menos, the movement against femicide. In Poland, women brought the country to a standstill in their struggle for abortion rights. Uh, we saw extraordinary uh, uh, women-led movements in, uh, in uh, India, uh, in Indonesia, and of course in Thailand in, in recent times. Um, while you know we saw the range and, and the depth of the Me Too movement uh, in, in the global north, which managed to topple rich and powerful men. So at this moment, despite the setbacks we've had with a pandemic, beside, uh, despite the setbacks we have had, um, in, in, in this particular year, what we witnessed, you know, before the pandemic and even uh, intermittently through 2020 is a rising tide of international feminist activism from Poland to Argentina, from Chile to Ireland, changing the cultures and cadences of politics. Indeed, the feminist movement is and has been alongside the anti-racist movement, anti-police violence movement, the only transnational movement of solidarity uh, that has been pro um, providing the basis for other social movements. But why is this? Why have we seen an explosion of women-led movements in, in recent years? And this is because for decades, Neoliberalism has led brutal attacks upon social spending, healthcare, education, pensions, all the ingredients that make life possible for working class communities have been cruelly cut away, leaving skeletal ruins in places where once there were robust communities. Women, queer and non-binary people in these communities have borne the worst burden for these cuts. And this is true uh, even uh, during uh, the pandemic. We saw, a, uh, we, we, we saw a rise in domestic violence across the board, all the way from China to uh, Morocco <coughs> because of the shelter in place laws, uh, which kind of put women back in the home, a lot of women uh, lost the job, uh, lost their jobs, to the extent that some feminist economists are calling um, this a, a she session rather than a recession. Um, and so, uh, in in times of crisis, anyway, women and queer people have borne the worst burden of uh, cuts to social spending. In the sphere of work, the cuts have been devastating for jobs where the majority of workforce are women, such as teaching, nursing, care work, and um, uh, retail. In the sphere of the home, cuts to provisions for housing or food subsidies have made women's lives precarious and unsafe, creating the conditions for gender violence. What we are witnessing then when women lead these movements uh, to demand social spending, to demand an end to gender violence, that social movement is a collective no to this neoliberal brutality from working class women globally. On the streets, women have led social movements against femicide and gender violence in workplaces, teachers, nurses, uh, and care workers have led strike waves. This is the feminism for the 99%, a feminism embodied in strikes and mass demonstrations. 
in anti-racist and anti-imperialist struggles, a feminism nourished by anti-capitalist traditions of the past from which it gathers the resources for a future free of capitalism. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Bhattacharya. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we can discuss about that uh, Sri Lanka has a long history of women's movement, uh, very popular names like uh, Kumar Jawardana, Malti Dialvis come to my mind. Uh, so I will now open the floor to uh, any comments, questions uh, that uh, you want to raise uh, and you know engage Professor Bhattacharya. The floor is open. Device mode. Audio. विरुद्ध क्रमेद uh yeah so buddhika is uh, posing a question on the abortion rights so he uh, recognizes that it is women's women's rights uh, but in sri lanka the discourse is such that when whenever the abortions or right to abortion comes to the forefront uh, women themselves oppose it and there have been incidents in the past uh, he mentions one example uh, a film called uh, sulankirilli uh, it's uh, directed by inoka satyangani which raised the mat issue of abortion there was a huge uh, uproar against it and the women's groups who were, which were campaigning uh, uh, abortion rights had a setback so he would like to know how do how could we mainstream uh, this you know rec re the recognition for abortion as a women's right so you obviously thank you so much for um asking that question um you know i i'm sure activists on the ground in sri lanka feminists on the ground in sri lanka have better answers than i can so i want to ask a question before i respond which is uh when you say women oppose abortion do you mean conservative groups uh professor bhattacharya ahanawa me kantawa me abortion rights walata viruddhawa katha kara kiyana kote e kiyanne me bohoma me samajik sampradayika kanta kandayam da kiyala oh godak welawata e katte thamma e kata viruddha wenne samaharata me ape ape vartamana me ara ken alut paramparaya kattiya te ekata viruddha wenna e kiyanne e katte eka රයිට්ස් එකක් විදියට ඉල්ලන්නේ නැහැ ඒ කට්ටිය කියන්නේ ඒක අවශ්‍ය නැහැ ඒක ගොඩක් වෙලාවට ඒ කියන්නේ මං එක පැත්තෙන් දකිනවා ඒක සමහරවිට අර ඒ කට්ටිය එකට විරුද්ධ වෙන හේතුව තමයි අර පිරිමියාට අවශ්‍ය විදියට අර හැඩ ගැසීම කියන කාරණාවත් එක්ක හැබැයි සමහරවිට අර අර ඒගොල්ලෝ මේ ඒකට විරුද්ධ වෙන්නේ 
අර ඒක Tamanta එක කියන්නේ ළමයා කියන එක අර අර මොන දේ වුණත් අර Tamanta ඕනේ කියන මතේ තියෙන විදිහට එතකොට මේ ඒක නිසා ඒකට විරුද්ධ වෙනවා අර සාම්ප්‍රදායික කට්ටිය තමයි ගොඩක් කලාට ඒක සිද්ධ වෙන්නේ ඔව් සාම්ප්‍රදායික කට්ටිය තමයි ගොඩක් කලාට ඒකට විරුද්ධ වෙන්නේ uh so buddhika says most often it's the conservative women and he also see younger women uh join in this crowd uh you know from the belief that they are socializing to the needs of men uh and that uh, abortion is not a right, need that mm-hmm. they have yeah. well i mean um that you know is is a universal feature in in all countries right so the right and conservative forces have women in them and like you know the sort of um racist uh politicians in in the US have black people supporting them you know so uh and as you well know probably as a marxist that working class people will often vote against their own interests right that um you know otherwise uh, hey we would all be living under socialism but if, how to correct that is is a more thorny question right we all know Uh, so first of all you know let me say something um glib uh which is sort of easy which is you know we know that the um ruling classes ideas are the ruling ideas of society right and that's for a reason it's and this is where um you know the the role of the family the role of public education systems uh come into play that capitalism actually uses these institutions to socialize uh both men and women into accepting and propagating its main ideas okay so what are the main ideas that the heteronormative family is the basic unit of society uh women should always work towards the preservation of that family rather than the preservation of our own bodily integrity and freedom right so if you allow if capitalism were to say that you know women should have bodily integrity that women should have bodily freedom then what if women refuse then to have children at all if they don't want to what if they refuse to get married what if you know so the bush the question of the bourgeois family which is the unit for the reproduction of the next generation of workers then comes into crisis this is why capitalist ideology in almost every country and in every decade actually is not a big supporter of abortion rights having said that it is also true that abor- women will always have abortions always this is the history of the world and the history of humanity women always will have abortions the question is if it is not legalized and easily accessible then they will have it in secret in dangerous ways there is a no law in the world ever to stop women from having abortions because that's that's the universal fact women will always have abortion the reason that feminists fight for legalized abortion is so that women can have them in safe conditions otherwise it'll simply go underground um and and so that's why we fight for so the question of opposing abortion is actually tied to the question of the bourgeois family right those who oppose abortion are actually working consciously or unconsciously towards upholding the institution of the bourgeois family which capitalism needs as well capitalism doesn't just need the worker to be in the workplace to produce profit capitalism also needs the regeneration and reproduction of the working class which is why the bourgeois family is the most important unit is one of the most important units for capitalism so how do we uh, how do we then fight for abortion rights so first of all i think we should fight for abortion rights as as i pointed out and um, as a social movement right right we should fight for abortion rights unashamedly 
clearly, you know, without like in the United States, for instance, uh, you know, liberal feminists also fight for abortion, but you know, the 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 main national organization uh, that provides abortion is Planned Parenthood, and Planned Parenthood is a very liberal feminist organization, and it 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 advertises abortion in this. Um, uh, sort of apologetic way, right? So when the right attacks Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood says, oh, we don't just provide abortion, we also provide health care, right? But abortion is health care. We should be unapologetic about it. So that's the first step, that abortion is a working class right, just as the right to food, water, and shelter is a working class right. It is not simply a feminist right. It is not simply the right of privileged women. It is the right of the class for women in the working class to access abortion. So we should fight about it tooth and nail, just like we fight for better wages. No one you know, in the Marxist tradition is ashamed to fight for better wages. You know, everybody says, oh, let's fight for better wages. But Marxists kind of take a step back when it's about abortion and say, well, our, our women comrades should fight for it. No, this is as much of a right as the better wages. So as Marxists and progressives, we should put that front and center and say, yes, this is an organization or this is a movement that fights for abortion rights as the right of the class. This is a class struggle issue. So that's the first thing that, you know, to, to wrest it away from liberal feminists and say, this is a working class demand and a working class issue. And, and if we manage to institute that uh, as a working class demand, then, you know, it, yes, it will also, uh, uh, you know, sort of benefit rich women, just like a, a universal healthcare will benefit rich women as well. But that's not the point. The point is that we fight for the majority to have this right. So that's one, that it's a class demand. The second is that we do not give over this right to liberal feminists, right? So this is not just about a feminist demand. This is a demand for the class as a whole, and we fight for it as working class women and men, because working class men's uh, social interest is tied to the right to fight for abortion, right? And so I think um, the, the, uh, we have a lot to learn from, um, you know, the, the Argentinian, our Argentinian comrades and our Polish comrades who have in recent time actually mounted um, uh, um, very successful um, uh, fight on the streets for abortion, right? So uh, one of the ways that they have done this is build this social movement and make it so strong in a grassroots way that unions have been forced to actually come and support it because it's so huge and so uh, uh, militant, right? And, and questioning. Uh, and, and let's also remember that when you question the bourgeois family, right? When you question the, the, the norm that women should um, uh, concede to the bourgeois pay family, you are actually questioning the very basis of capitalism, right? So then anti the, the fight for abortion then can blossom and flower into an anti-capitalist demand. We, we've got to make sure that it's uh, rather than simply a question of a formal equal right. Thank you. Um, I can only, uh... I think would you can understand I think Harry Monk Martha no me Judith Butler sexual rights and win penny sit make and Mitana me are a bush and nekai, could occur domestic violence again with right. 
මේතකොට ඒකත් මේ ලෝකේ පුරාම කතා බහකට ලක් වෙන්න පුළුවන් විශේෂයෙන්ම අර ලෙස්බියලිසම් කියන එක මේ කියන්නේ අපේ අර ඒකත් ආසියාතික අපේ රටකට මම මේ ආධාර කරලා අහන්නේ ගොඩක් වෙලාවට මේකට අර අර ලොකු විරෝධයක් යනවා අර සමාජයේ තුල ඒ කියන්නේ කාන්තාවකට ඒක පැත්තකට ඒක ඇගේ අයිතියක් මේ තමන්ගේ මේ ලිංගිකත්වයේ මොකද්ද කියන එක තේරුම් මේ හොයා ගන්න ඒක පුරුෂයාට තීරණය කරන්නත් බෑ අදාළ සංස්කෘතියට තීරණය කරන්නත් බෑ එතකොට ඒකට මේ එකත් අර අර එක මේ ලෙස්බියලිසම් එක ගැන හරි නැත්තම් සෙක්ෂුවල් රයිට් රයිට් සම්බන්ධව මේ යම් ආකාරයක මේ කියන්නේ අර අපි කියන්නේ මේ ලෝකේ පුරාම මොකක් හරි සංවිධානාත්මක වැඩපිළිවෙලක් යනවාද ඒ කියන්නේ මේකත් අර මම හිතන්නේ කැපිටලිසම් එකෙන්ම ලබා ගත යුතු අර එකට විරුද්ධව ගිහිල්ලි වල ලබා ගත යුතු දෙයක් වෙනවා නැත්තම් අර අර අපි කියන්නේ පීට්‍රමූලික සමාජ ක්‍රමය තුල මේක පුරුෂයා අපි කාන්තාව පුරුෂයත් එක්ක සම්බන්ධතාවය පැවැත්විය යුතුයි කියන එකට වඩා එහා ගිය කතාවක් එතනින් සාකච්ඡා කරන නිසා මේ එතකොට ඒ වගේ මොකක් හරි ඒ කියන්නේ ඒ සම්බන්ධයෙන් එකත් රයිට්ස් එකක් විදිහට ඉල්ලිය යුතුයි නේද කියන එක මේ අහන්න දෙයක් ආ පුතික රයිසස් සෙකන්ඩ් ක්වෙස්චන් සෝ හි ඇ මින් ඇස් මච් ඇස් වී ආ ගෝයිං ෆෝවර්ඩ් විත් රයිට් ටු අබෝෂන් හි ආස්ක් අබවුට් සෙක්ෂුවල් රයිට්ස් ලයික් led by people like Judith Butler uh, on recognizing sorry uh, uh, amali you you, you know the recognition right. of the sorry amali you broke oh. up i couldn't hear you okay is it better now yes yeah okay uh, so his question is related to sexual rights uh, he says that it it is also a, a right that we should uh, gain or win from the capitalist system which is backed by patriarch patriarchy so he's like asking like shouldn't we like broaden our struggles on these issues well my answer is yes so i mean again um we come back to the question of the bourgeois family right um why does capitalism need the bourgeois family capitalism needs the bourgeois family because it is the most reliable institution to reproduce the next generation of workers it's the most reliable there are other ways that capitalism can reproduce a workforce one is slavery the other is immigration but the bourgeois but those are all you know sort of vi- too violent to be commonplace right so capitalism needs a reliable low maintenance commonplace institution to reproduce the next generation of workers and so the bourgeois family and 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 capitalism experimented right it's it, the bourgeois family did not arise you know out of the blue there were several historical experimentations with the institution over time but then the heteronormative uh bourgeois family emerged as the um as as the most reliable institution for um capitalism and queer ness in general right and uh actually threatens the stability of that bourgeois family which is why um capitalism you know is is eager to say thing once uh, well first of all it tried in in the throughout the 19th and early 20th century it tried it tried to completely deny gay people any rights right so because it saw gay rights as threatening the heteronormative family unit but once uh, our um, queer and gay comrades led actual social movements and forced the hand of the capitalist state then what the capital the the the, the form that the capitalist state accepted of gay liberation is gay marriage right so in other words it's that we don't want to talk about all your deviant sexual issues you sleeping with lots of people what we want to talk about is the stable gay family unit get married have children in other words 
reproduce the family unit just in a homonormative way rather than a heteronormative way, right? So, so this is, again, we come back to the question of the bourgeois family and capitalism's dependence on it, right? And so when we fight for gay rights, we must fight also to abolish in a certain way the bourgeois family. And whenever I say, you know, abolish the family, people say, oh, what are we not going to have love and caring under capitalism, uh, under socialism? Well, of course we are, but we don't have it in the form dictated to us, right? Just like uh, people say, uh, when I say we shouldn't have private kitchens under socialism, right? It is wasteful and nonsensical for all of us to have individual private kitchens. Then people say, well, I want to cook for my loved ones. Yes, so do I. Well, actually I don't, I don't like cooking, but okay, sometimes I would like to cook, but it should be my choice. It should not be a necessity that I have to do it every day after work, right? It should be a choice but if there was a communal kitchen, the way the Bolsheviks envisioned it, then what we could do is we share out the cooking tasks over the neighborhood, but then that does not stop us from cooking a special meal for a loved one if we do want to. So it becomes a real choice rather than a dreadful necessity. Similarly, when we talk about the abolition of family, that does not mean that women and men or men and men or women and women do not love each other or form units together or have babies together. What we want to say is that should be an actual choice to do so rather than a necessity imposed on us by the structures around us. Thank you. Apart from Prashna, keep a gun, dekakari, tunakari, ilanga. We can take uh, a couple of questions, maybe two or three questions. Uh, Comrade Dupali had a question. Upali Sahodria. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Professor Bhattacharya, for uh, you know presenting your thesis, and I think it's interesting the way that you uh, make the point about or rather the distinction between the liberal feminism and Mar what you call Marxist feminism. Uh, now, uh, I mean, I would like to know further, how do you really make that dis distinction? Because when it comes to Sri Lanka, I mean, since you said that you would like to know more about Sri Lankan situation as well, I mean, as far as I um, know, and also I have been able to work with uh, Sunila Abhisekar and also Kamla Bashin from India, who is a gender activist. And, and both of them tried hard in Sri Lanka to you know, penetrate the community level, like a, you know, engage with the community in such a way to uh, talk about the gender equality. And, and that I think you would call it uh, liberal feminism because um, it was, uh, I mean, I feel, to be fair by them, also to be uh, have a, to have a critique that uh, it was a bit elitist in terms of uh, you know not being able to penetrate the community in that way. So the question is, you know, the issues that you are talking about, abortion and sexual rights, are the same ones the liberal feminists also bringing out, and and as you said, uh, you know, protecting the bourgeois family or talking about the family values. So the question for the leftist movement in Sri Lanka or people who are working on uh, what we call uh, Marxist feminism, 
uh, need to understand or we need to learn more about how do you distinguish between the two? How do you really uh, find, I mean, how liberal feminists are present in this case? And if we call ourselves Marxist feminist, how do we present that? You know, if it is the same issue that we are fighting for, then the people can be confused. So the, my, I mean, it's not a question, but it's also a discussion point. So it's, an, what is the ideological difference you know, in, in terms of the discourse? And, and in, in that way, uh, I mean, have you experienced in, in States or in India where you have been successful in bringing out that uh, Marxist orientation to the communities? Because, you know, it, it is always looked uh, down upon in Sri Lanka when we talk about uh, equality or feminist uh, rights. So it's considered as elitist thing. So how, how do we kind of overcome this particular, you know, dilemma? Thanks. Sorry, Amali, do you want to take a few more questions? Yeah, there's another question. I... Comrade Skander, do you want to pause it? Okay, I'll, I'll read it for you. Uh, so Comrade Skander Kumar is posing the question, uh, why is liberal feminism hegemonic in women's movements, especially NGOs in parts uh, of the global South, say Sri Lanka, including led by, I'm just reading it, uh, including led by women's radicalists, radicalized in the new left and the second wave of feminism. For example, women's political participation say in equality of representation in political institutions has displaced working women's struggles on living wage, housing, socialized house care, uh, how, child care, et cetera. Um, okay, so I, I guess the two, two questions are actually um, connected uh, yeah. because it, it, the question is, how do we wrest the issues from the liberal feminists and make it a Marxist issue, right? So I think there, there was a, I would say that there is a retreat. There was a retreat at one point within the communist movement worldwide <clears throat> where uh, Marxists and communists conceded the ground of women's liberation to uh, liberal feminists, right? So if we look at the history of the communist movement at the very start of, of and, and at and its um, high point, which is a Bolsheviks in Russia, we will see that the question of women's liberation, you know, in the writings of Kolontai, the question of sexual liberation in the writings of Kolontai, in Inessa Arman, in even uh, Kripskaya was central to the Bolshevik um, uh, project, right? That, um, and I mean, if, if you, I'm, I'm sure you've read uh, Lenin on housework, okay? He does not mince his words. In fact, uh, he basically says that what I am seeing right now is that uh, comrades are doing a lot of the work and then they go home and let their wives actually do the majority of housework. And that is just not acceptable, right? So there was a moment in the Marxist movement when women's liberation was correctly understood to be the beating heart of anti-capitalism. If you concede the right of, if you concede the struggle for women's liberation, then you have conceded half the battle comrades, right? So because the abolition the capitalism does not depend on the wage form alone. The capitalism depends on two things. One is the wage form, the, the realm of exploitation. The other is the bourgeois family, the realm of oppression. Both of these institutions are equally needed. So we cannot conceive the ground. The Marxist movement uh, from uh, you know uh, the mid middle of the 20th century onwards and even later actually saw itself as a defender of 
the fight against the wage form rather than the fight against the family. You know, I grew up in uh, in in India, uh, in in Bengal, where you know uh, the Marxist, the so-called Marxist left, was in power for decades in my state, and I never heard any criticism of the bourgeois family. You know, comrades around, uh, you know, members and comrades were perfectly fine with integrating questions of family and family value. And the Marxist struggle was about necessarily the wage and living conditions, but living conditions are about women's liberation, right? The right of bodily integrity is a class struggle issue. So I think we need to champion as Marxists, not a feminism, but a class struggle feminism. And, and the best way to do that, I think, is to actually relate the question of why capitalism needs bourgeois family, to relate the question of why uh, you know, bodily integrity or sexual rights is a class struggle right in our publication, in our movements, is I think the 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 way forward. And you know, go uh, you know, we need to all go back and read. Uh, Lenin and Kollontai and see some of the models that the Bolsheviks set up in order to talk about the, the absolute oppression of the family, again, and, and talk about what actually love and choice mean in the working class movement, and, and be completely unapologetic about it. We cannot cede the ground to liberal feminism. And, and just because uh, liberal feminism is about winning some rights for ruling class women and queer people rather than actual abolition of the institutions that create these oppressions, right? So, so this is in a way our job to integrate that into the working class movement. Uh, I think there's another uh, part to the both questions because uh, now the liberal feminism as like the one represented by most of the NGOs uh, and you know, that is the popular phase of feminism. And there is a general condescendation in, I think in everywhere and particularly like we know since we are from Sri Lanka, uh, people react uh, in a very defensive or negative way when we talk about like feminism or claim ourselves as feminists. So how do we, I mean, overcome this kind of, you know, situation like in going to the people because it automatically generates this kind of firewall. Uh, I think Nimanti has a question. Also Nianti. Can you hear me? Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of a way to connect kind of what's going on in terms of uh, race politics and feminism in the US and related to what's going on in Sri Lanka in terms of a country that, you know, fought a long ethnic conflict um, and minorities, you know, at the end of the war did not end up in a better place at all. And I'm thinking about, you know, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement in the US, which has been so important and this last summer we saw it explode, right? And the way in which even in this election, um, black women have been instrumental. And so how to think about kind of black women's leadership and activism and organizing both around issues of gender and race as kind of crucial and class. Um, and to kind of try to understand how like the history of that intersection maybe would be useful for us in thinking about how we think about like ethnic politics in Sri Lanka, right? Like minority rights as it intersects with questions of capitalism and kind of holding them both together. Um, Cause I think often we tend to think of like, there's a dismissal within certain groups of like ethnic rights as identity politics. Um, and I think like this not thinking of minority rights as identity politics as, but as deeply integrated to issues of capitalism and feminism. Um, and I'm wondering if there's a way to 
to use the Black Lives Matter movement to think these things through and for us to think about how that can happen in Sri Lanka too. Thank you, Nimanti. That's that's very useful. Um, you know, um, one of the uh, things, and you know, I'm exploring ideas with you here because you will know much better than me the Sri Lankan situation. Um, so, to talk about BLM in the in the U.S. context, uh, this was the best and the fiercest uprising that the US has seen since the 1960s, okay? Uh, it, there has been nothing like this. What is interesting to me was that the leadership of the movement was completely new. It wasn't the established left at all, okay? So, you know, the left turned up for the demonstrations and, and what have you, but to be honest, we did not recognize any of the faces because they did not come from the traditional left layers. They were completely new folks who just came out in anger and organized against police violence, okay? And this was fantastic, right? Because you don't want to go to a demonstration where you know everyone because then you know it's not a massive movement, right? So this was, so that was a very important, for me, uh, a learning, um, issue here that this is a new generation of young people and a, a, an older generation combined together uh, kind of coming out against police violence, right? So that's one. The second learning point was how deeply multiracial it was, okay? So when the last bout of police um, uh, activism against police violence happened, which was Ferguson, uh, Michael Brown's death. Um, I went to Ferguson at the time to, to uh, talk to folks and, and, and you know, uh, write about uh, what was going on on the ground. And the movement was brilliant. I, I had some of the best uh, days of my life in, during the Ferguson protest, but it was an all black movement, okay? This time around, however, it was deeply multiracial, okay? And in several cities across the US, you had high school students actually leading demonstrations, calling demonstrations, just, you know, getting together with their friends, putting it on Facebook, and then a huge uh, demonstration explodes in, in the city uh, the next day. So the reason I think why this is so significant for us to think about feminism and so on is because when you think about the issue, it is about police violence, right? Uh, and it is, and, and the demand is defund the police. Now, if you go and talk to these people, right? I very much doubt how many of them have read Marx or Lenin or what have you, okay? But it's not important. What is important is that their movement is challenging the very basis of capitalist violence, right? And that's why as a left, we need to call this movement a part of the working class struggle, right? We, we need to join this movement and try to support it and expand it because the left also has some skills, you know? We come with a toolbox of organizing skills and organizing histories that we can share with this movement as well as learn from the movement, right? So, but if the left kind of holds back and says, well, you know, this is not about wages in particular, or this is not about, you know, whatever, then we're missing a real moment in uh, the history of working class radicalization. And I think that goes the same way for the feminist movement. If we have women protesting against gender violence or domestic violence, that is not just a feminist issue. It is actually a deeply anti-capitalist issue, right? So, and, and we, need to, uh, we need to join that. We need to deepen that struggle. We need to uh, build lines of solidarity because again, the left is actually the memory of the working class. And we can bring to struggle a lot of historical experience that we have gained as, as a global left, right? So, um, but we have to do it 
uh, in a way that is uh, humble as well. We have a lot to teach, but we also have a lot to learn. So we can't go, and you know, movements have to learn through um, making mistakes. You, we can't go in there and say, hey, you should not collaborate, you, you should not say that the police are also our friend. Yes, we should say that, but <laughs> We sh but but the movement also has to learn on its own, right? That that it's not a case of bad apples; it's the institution that's rotten. And no matter of finger wagging that we do to the movement is going to make it learn that way. We can educate the movement, but we also need to be humble in that education. We need to explain, you know, Lenin's phrase, patiently explain, right, rather than prescribe or dictate. So to come back to the NGO, again, I will go back to the point that I think we have to not question only what, uh, uh, you know, uh, we can't just blame the NGOs. I, we should blame the NGOs at every opportunity, but we can't just blame the NGOs for raising questions of sexual liberation and feminism. We have to trace back into our history as to where we conceded the ground to them. Why didn't the, there had, has to have been a gap in the social movement where the NGOs could step in and raise these issues in their way. And so it cannot simply be, oh, you know, the NGOs have taken over. Of course, the NGOs will take over because that's, you know, the dominant ideas of capitalism are compatible with the NGO. But we must ask ourselves where we as a Marxist left retreated on these issues and allowed for a space to open up for NGOs to step in. But you know, it is also not a question of us, you know, uh, sitting at home and, and, and blaming ourselves and doing sort of a study circle of self blame. It is about reclaiming the ground by talking about anti capitalist feminism rather than, uh, you know, simple feminism, right? We need to talk. This is why we called our book Feminism for the 99%, because we needed to reclaim feminism from empowerment and sexual liberation for, you know, a handful of um, people to go to clubs and be gay. This is about uh, the sexual rights and sexual autonomy for the entire working class that we are fighting for. And we need to produce booklets. We need to do public education on working class sexuality, right? What, you know, uh, I, 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 I don't know what the history of that is in Sri Lanka, but uh, in, in the case of India and the United States, um, a lot of work has been done on tracing uh, the, the working class roots of gay liberation, right? That this is not a bourgeois movement that comes out of the blue, that the bourgeoisie has a right to whatever, but what are the working class roots of the gay movement of sexual liberation? And we need to, investigate that in our own countries and, and publicize that and, and do public education that this is not your movement. This is our movement. It's our class that needs the liberation uh, and, and, and approach it in that sort of class struggle way. Yandini, you had a question. Um, yeah, um, actually my question is in relation to uh, your other work on social reproduction um, theory. Um, I was wondering about the, the kind of crisis of care, um, you know, which, which the book talks about um, and the kind of shifts in, in social reproduction, right, with the kind of neoliberal phase. Um, and it seemed like, the, you know, in the book, um, you you were all pointing to the the kind of the contradictions within social reproduction and the, and the crisis that emerges from. Um, so one question I have is like with with the pandemic, um, it seems like that the, the the burden has shifted even more towards the social reproduction sphere, um, especially here in Sri Lanka when we're already in an economic crisis and you know um, uh, the kind of relief for um, the pandemic related stuff has been very low in terms of the stimulus package the government has been able to afford. 
Um, so there is no choice, but you know, all of that burden is shifted to the 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 how home and the you know the, the social reproductive sphere. Um, and there's very little acknowledgement or kind of discussion about it. Um, so I was just wondering um, how you are kind of thinking about this current moment. Um, has the crisis hit already um, in the way you're talking about it in the book? And I'm also thinking about this in, in the kind of the larger framing that, you know, uh, of social reproduction in terms of education and, you know, other, other kind of, um, is, is this a, a defining shift? Are we going to see like a change in the trajectory of, uh, you know, what's going to happen in the social reproduction sphere? Or are we going to see kind of a deepening of the kind of exploitation and, and the kind of stretching of, you know, that sphere to, to a, another level? Thanks. Hey, uh, thank you, Niantani. That's that's um, you know, wonderful question. And again, you know, my answers are not um, immensely hopeful, but they are hopeful in their framework. And uh, and so, yes, I think the crisis has hit. You know, in the uh, the richest country of the world, which is the United States. Uh, child hunger is now out of control, okay? Uh, and we saw, or you all saw, that the pandemic, how disproportionately the pandemic hit uh, communities and families of color, okay? And what the pandemic has shown is not just, uh, you know, the current crisis, right? What the pandemic has shown is how particular communities, particular countries were already vulnerable, okay? And so this is, so that, those fault lines, because the virus is completely democratic, right? As, as, as a micro, it is completely democratic. It'll hit whoever it, it can, right? However, then the pandemic should have affected all of us equally because the virus's nature is democratic, but we saw how the consequences of the virus were absolutely and deeply unequal and undemocratic, which what it proves is how the virus exposed, if you like, the already existing vulnerabilities in countries and communities, right? And so it is not, is something that I think uh, uh, was known to us as Marxists and feminists have now become clear to a much broader section of the populace, right? That, that this is an unequal society and this is a deeply unfair society, right? So, so the virus I think has done that work of exposing that. Now it can go either way. Okay, on the one hand, this can lead to massive disillusionment with existing institutions of protest and power, or it can lead to an explosion of protests as we saw during the Black Lives Matter uh, protests over the summer. And I'm holding out for the second, but if I'm holding out for the second, then what is the task of the global left? I think the task of the global left right now is to insist on illegal mobilization. This is my um, this is my real thing. Ill by illegal mobilization, I mean that we cannot allow bourgeois political formations, whether they're political parties or NGOs, to actually lead the struggle against. Uh, it, you know, the, the, the crisis of capitalism, the twin crisis of capitalism and the pandemic, right? Because we, are, we were headed to a recession, whether there was a, going to be a pandemic or not. We, we, the, the world was headed towards that recession. It's just going to get worse with a global pandemic, right? So by, by illegal, I mean this. Uh, we saw uh, recently uh, in, in India, they called a general strike, which is great. I think that's fantastic that we should call, uh, and, and I, I stand in solidarity with the general strike that was called, but we also have to take a lesson why the farmers movement right now, 
which is completely not within any structure, is actually having more resonance than the left party called general strike, right? Because it is a truly grassroots movement and, 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 and it's shaking the fascist uh, Modi um, uh, government to a certain extent. So I think established, timid, uh, politics within the norms set out by bourgeois society, that time is over. We have to talk about widespread illegal mobilization and disruptive movements to the bourgeois order. And, you know, I cannot speak for Sri Lanka. Obviously, I wouldn't uh, presume to, but that is mostly what we need in the United States because the trade unions in the United States are completely tied to the Democratic Party, okay? So if the trade union calls for anything, it will be within these sort of polite norms of negotiation within the capitalist bounds of political formation, right? Instead, what we need is illegal strikes, disruption of the workplace, and sending a message to the Biden government that it cannot get away with imposing back normal austerity rather than racist austerity that, that um, you know, Trump was, Trump was doing. So, so that, to me, um, it, to, 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 is a long-winded way to answer uh, your question, Neanthony, which is, Yes, there's a crisis in social reproduction. And actually, as a global left, we have a responsibility to lead and contribute to an anti-capitalist feminist fight against it. Uh, okay. May I ask a question? Okay, uh, according to my readings, uh, compared with the institu formal institution, there are huge conflict between informal cons uh, institution uh, such as religion, religions, ethics, uh, all sort of different uh, uh, belief uh, and feminism. Uh, what your uh, what your opinion in this regard? I'm sorry. I, I could you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know my pr pronunciation, you can... Uh, no, no, I understand, understand very well. I yeah. just couldn't okay. hear you probably. Uh, yeah, there are huge uh, com uh, conflict between uh, formal, informal institutions such as religions, uh, ethics, uh, all sort of different uh, belief and feminism, right? Uh, what's your... Uh, opinion in this regard. Uh, there are, now we are actually discussing mainly uh, formal institutions and feminism, some uh, conflict. But uh, may in, uh, for example, in my readings, in many countries, uh, there are huge conflict between actually uh, hum, uh, uh, um, uh, female rights, woman rights, or uh, feminism, and informal institutions such as such as religion religions such ethics, as religion religions ethics and belief can can you give me an example i'm uh, not okay, sure i understand do you mean uh, like Amla, the catholic you, church uh, amali can you understand my question no no i understood your question but i'm not sure what you mean by informal institutions like ethics. yeah for example uh, you know uh, now uh, no, we are, uh, uh, for example, uh, in Pakistan, um, uh, uh, there are huge uh, earlier. Uh, can you remember that? Uh, uh, I, I forget that uh, girl's name. Uh, she uh, she was suited. Uh, Malala. Malala. Yeah, yeah, Malala Yusuf. Uh, yeah. Then uh, uh, education, uh, woman education. Uh, and uh, religious conflict there, according to my reading. I don't know whether it's it, uh, anything else. But uh, then when we uh, discuss with uh, mainly uh, male uh, women rights, then there are a huge conflict with that kind of informal institutions. They always uh, attack. Sometimes they don't allow or they, don't, they go against uh, 
compare with formal institution for example uh, as you said that uh, government or uh, some um, institution work some office or some kind of uh, industry or any place formal places compare with formal places informal places are most worse to pro provide that kind of rights to uh, uh, women so I, I i'm not sure if um i'm not sure if i agree i wouldn't call the catholic church for instance which is one of the premier institutions in poland for instance uh, where feminists have fought, are fighting right now for uh, full abortion rights. It's the same in Argentina. The Catholic Church has played a very major role in uh, opposing abortion rights and, and feminist rights. I'm not sure if I would call ca um, the Catholic Church an informal institution, uh, particularly in the case of Latin America. We saw in Brazil, for instance, the Catholic Church and the uh, evangelist movement uh, actually is one of the key uh, recruiting grounds for Bolsonaro. So, um, I would call them non-state actors, if that's what you're um, referring to. And absolutely right, they're not state actors, but they're not they're not informal institutions in that sense. They are also very key institutions of reproduction of capitalist relations, right? They are invested in the reproduction of capitalist social relations. So I'm not sure. Um, um, why why we should exclude them from our understanding of anti-capitalist um, you know activism as, as it were and you know for instance um, if we uh, if we look I mean one of the um, uh, you know you mentioned Malala uh, and and you know all power to her for standing up to the Taliban but we also should be aware why the Western media, especially in the global North, picked on Malala to actually uh, glorify Malala's struggle. It, it, Malala's struggle is just as important as the struggle of the, uh, you know, Mothers for Jaffna or um, the Mother's Front, I think it was called in, in Sri Lanka, and the Palestinian women's struggle, right? But Malala was chosen because of the deeply Islamophobic nature of uh, 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 global uh, media uh, and global North institutions. It was all, she was also in a way recruited by American imperialism in their battle against the Taliban and, and their fight in Afghanistan, right? So, this is not to say that as a left, we cannot support Malala, but I think we should raise the slogan that Malala's struggle is just as important as the struggle of young Palestinian girls in the killing fields of Gaza and, and Israel who are fighting for education against the Zionist state, right? That's an equally important struggle. So we cannot uh, you know, highlight Malala's struggle and not that of the Palestinian girls, right? So, um, so this, in a way, then we are not, then we expose both uh, the, the need for feminism, but we also at the same time expose Western imperialist hypocrisy in actually claiming to be the, the, the champion of women's rights when all it wants is to co-opt the language of feminism to um, uh, champion imperialist projects rather than real liberation for women. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so it's coming from a personal experience a couple of years ago and we uh, got together to talk about, you know, need for feminist politics and uh, issues that women face particularly in the left, which uh, fights for liberation in general, but it is still like in the, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's across the globe, it's, but in Sri Lanka, particularly because we feel it, uh, even within the left, women fe face numerous discriminations. Mm -hmm. So 
the automatic response is like whenever you go to discuss about women's issues and women's politics in the left, uh, because how the how the left space is pol socialized, uh, and you know the kind of dominance of male comrades in that space, the automatic response from the women is to of their own. Uh, wait, say like Amali. a political party of women. Amelie, wait, you, you broke up. Oh, the automatic, me, I, will, I, I, I got will, all of it, yes. but I just get there that the automatic okay. response is? So the response is to form a political party of women, uh, a party of women, right? A space of women, exclusive space, because we cannot, or oh, the assumption is we cannot occupy uh the space of like say the unions or other political parties because they are dominant male dominant spaces so i would like i mean i would like to hear what you think about such and such responses uh as part of feminist politics or in you know trying to uh, foster a women's movement so is this response coming from women amali yeah yeah yeah. Okay. Um, so my my position on that is, uh, you know, we've discussed. First of all, I want to acknowledge and I want to thank you, Amali, for raising this issue because this is a deeply, deeply problematic issue in the left, yeah. and it is, and you know, it takes. I've been on the left in India for most of my young age. And I know firsthand what you talk of, the courage it takes to even speak up at meetings, uh, the, uh, the, the exile, that the banishment that often happens if you raise too many of these issues, how you are considered deviant and how you are, uh, you have sold out to bourgeois feminism by constantly raising feminist issues. So we know all of these tricks that women, particularly on the left, have had to bear historically. But so I want to acknowledge that. And I want to say clearly to you, Amali, that I was hoping someone would raise that. And I, I want to thank you for doing that. Uh, it, it takes a lot of courage and conviction to be able to do such a thing in, in, in public and uh, even in, in small meetings. So thank you. And please know that um, two things, one that I stand in solidarity, but also that a lot of your women comrades stand in solidarity with you, along with a lot of male comrades, right? There is a silence that many men and women are sort of intimidated to break because there is a question of authority and legitimacy. But please know that from my experience anyway, a lot of male and female comrades will stand in solidarity with you, even if they're not speaking out uh, openly, right? So then the response is twofold. That happens historically to women in left organizations. One is they leave, right? And, and they leave the floor to the same men who continuously reproduce the same relations within the organization or group. So they leave or they demand a space of their own to discuss politics, right? Where they feel more open and clear. And in an ideal world, Amali, we would not need a separate women's cell to actually discuss women's issues and questions of intimidation. So yes, but I think we should not be principally against a women's cell within a left organization if women in that organization feel the need to do so. Okay, as Marxists and social justice activists, we support the right of the, uh, of the oppressed to organize in any way possible, and we support that. We may have criticisms, we may have discussions and debates about it, but we support the right of self-organization of all oppressed people. And, you know, I think 
if women in an organization feel that that is the best first step to integrate these issues into the organization of, as a whole, then they have every right to do so, right? But, uh, and people who are opposing that should remember that the alternative is that the women will leave because if they feel that they do not have the level of comfort to actually discuss these issues, then they will simply, you know, give up activism uh, and, and fall silent or just leave, right? Instead, if this is seen as an intermediary step, this is not a permanent step, but an intermediary step for women to actually organize or um, and, and, and kind of, um, discuss amongst themselves and then bring it to the larger whole and, and do that, then I think this is, then people should consider this as actually a positive step forward, right? And so, I mean, you know, if it wasn't, then the Bolsheviks wouldn't have a separate women's, uh, you know, uh, organization and a women's department, right? If they could if they could say, hey, you know, we've got socialism, so no more need for that. But actually, there was a separate women's department in order to discuss precisely these kind of issues. And um, Inessa Armand and Colin Tai fought tooth and nail to do that. So um, I think we cannot have it as a principle that all organizations should have women's cells but we cannot be opposed to it on principle as well. We should see that as a question of tactic and, and a question of effective organizing. If that's gonna increase participation and you know, the, the comfort of women, then we should absolutely be all in support of it. I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah, Mal, Mata. I know, yeah. Oh. Uh, uh, Mata Podi plus Tiki Petinua, Ekatamai then me at that me, Professor Batachare, uh, Idripat Karapu, anti capitalist, uh, feminist movement, a pity by the other, Mami Tani Lankawe, uh, Kama, um, Palavina Tartama, Mia Karet, Miyagi Sakacha, Siduni Mandan edit. Would the Lankawe? Bamanshik Vapare, Hugak, Saktimatu, Tibuna Unat, may feminist woman take had him pity by the Prasne, Saka Chauni, Vami Vapare, Tul and Nimi. Aim pitted Samar Lat, Vami Vapata, the Kasan, Nevitipu Kumar Java, the Naga, me Prasne Matukla, take Hunga, Matukale, at that me Matatirin had his Nang, Matukale, me anti capitalist. They mama couldn't me. Uh any sama Lanka me feminist movement take a harima dural that the in me that catule at the me feminist movement take a are a sampradai feminist movement take a winas Vada Waman Shika Viplavakari Danapati Virodi uh Desata Yamukaragani Musanda uh Machara to me uh, Idri Patkar Pada Sitam, Progeno Tinirama, and Kalpadagrani. You translate the uh, Amali. I understood the Dhanapati Virodi. Yeah, you understand. <laughs> well, I understand some words. How did I brush there? I don't know the name, Professor Matakari, and that tone. Monk, I'm a monk, 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 May can't a South Yang make it a Tulgaraganatin Amaru. Eka Ekatian are a male dominant second person with Rank Nemi. Methian Soba, Meth Samaj Sobavi would. May Samaj a Pedene Sobavi would. Can't have a Yatakaragan in that three Gulantina, our Stavanga, you were under Darma Lubalagan Latino, Paul Bagaking, Paro Latino, Rasa Prasatino, then Ada and Uganda Tegulanti Latino, and may Tatang would in Sala. Dushkar that you know, to go to a calm, Missisham, Kanta, South and Tender, our seed, the Kata Hadadim, Miwagi Sakacha, Mangatule, me, Burti Samitia, Wamash, Sanguidan, Atule, Ectra Satanak to in Tamaka and the wind. In Graham Kalpanagaran. That's my view. So, 
comrade neil is from uh, a prominent uh, trade union he's uh, a trade union leader in sri lanka so his comment is uh, his according to his belief uh, the women's movement in sri lanka was not anti capitalist in nature maybe with exceptions like people like kumari jawardhana uh, and his his uh, issue is with uh, women are, women comrades are also they have to Amali, tackle the again, various sorry. obligation amali his niche i'm I, sorry i will yeah i will switch off maybe it will be better yeah is it That's better a, now yeah it's better just just go back to where you said his issue is yes so he is he points out that uh, the women's movement in sri lanka was not or is not anti capitalist if you if you, if you want to generalize it uh, maybe with exceptions like uh, kumar jawardhana who mm-hmm. who was part of the left movement uh, and he won't, he points out various issues uh, p- women comrades face in joining actively with left politics especially because they have to they have multiple obligations at the social reproduction level you know at the household mm-hmm. so uh, he he feel that uh, to enable women comrades the left and the trade unions also have to launch a struggle to empower women uh, to you know to free themselves from these household obligations uh yes i i i uh, i think there might be an issue of translation but i'm sure uh, women don't need other people to empower them i'm i'm sure women are perfectly capable of empowering themselves but it is the responsibility of the left to allow for conditions of empowerment right so for instance one of the things that's very easy to do and is not done often enough in my mind is when left organizations call meetings at whatever time of the day to provide childcare so that women can actually come to the meeting and bring their children okay it's a very simple step but providing childcare is also you know it shouldn't be that women can come to the meeting while some other woman is taking care of the children no male comrades should be doing childcare while uh, you know uh, women get to attend the these meetings because again this is not a question of women's liberation this is also a question of human liberation and more men doing childcare is actually good for the men themselves right in 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 uh, getting them to be part of the liberation similarly when major demonstrations are called often childcare is not provided so this is a lesson we can learn from the feminist strikes uh, which engulfed uh, you know many countries of the um uh, uh in in uh, you know um southern europe i want to say spain uh in particular italy and you know most of uh latin america chile argentina brazil and and uh, and peru and others which is when these feminist strikes took place on march 8th um actually the organizing committee of women made sure that childcare was provided for the day of the strike so that more women could participate in the striking rather than have to stay home and and take care of their um, uh, of their families and offspring so these are very very minor but very important steps that left wing organizations and even progressive organizations can take in order to create a tradition of building faith and building solidarity with uh, with uh, uh, the women's uh, liberation struggle right so this is again not something that ngos should be talking about this is something trade unions and uh, marxist organizations should be talking about how we are leading the battle for women's liberation rather than leaving it to liberal organizations uh we have one more question do you hey, have amali a- i have to go because oh. i i have to uh, go to the doctors at 11 oh, oh. o'clock and it takes 20 know. minutes to drive okay so thank you i let me uh, i think conclude the meeting thank you so much
uh, Professor Bhattacharya for meeting us Thank and uh, taking so many questions and uh, comments. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, we are in a, I think better, like the better shape now. Uh, and uh, I'm, I, I personally have benefited from your work uh, on social reproduction uh, and, you know, the care work. Uh, yeah, so I will conclude the meeting now. Uh, thank you very much. Hey, Amali, thank you so much for sharing. And thank you to all the comrades who participated and, and asked such brilliant questions. I hope we stay in touch and I hope we continue to have these conversations. Thank you so much for having me. And, uh, and again, I, I would love to know more if you've written some things, I would love to know and, 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 and talk about and, you know, um, um, movements that you guys are involved in. Okay, thank you again. And thank you, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, very thank much. you very thank much. You. Uh, yeah, there is an announcement uh, on 19th Saturday at 6 o'clock, there is a discussion on the budget, uh, not organized by the Marx School, but organized by the <coughs> Working People's Research Group. And there are three speakers. It's a trilingual meeting, singular, Tamil and English. So those who are free are requested to present uh, on 19th at 6 o'clock. Uh, we will send the link probably at the beginning of the next week. Thank you very much. ृष्टियान कांता वांटे विनम्रूर्ति के समीते कुटने का नॉने किए ना आधा हसक मत तीन हो दें अत्यंत में दें अमाली क्यों गोवा के विनम्र कांता वांटे विनम्र देशपाल ने पक्ष हादन वाके काम करो पांती भी आप आ रही है तुलत एक कांता वांटे विनम्र संगीतान को कुटने का नॉने किए ना आधा हसक साक अच्छा विनम्रा � नमूद एम प्रश्न तीन देंगा पिटे तीन प्रश्न तमाय देंग का मैं नायक आते दिन न अपिटे इड दिन न पुड़ों अंकांता वांटा उन्ह तरंग नमूद कांता वही मी इधरी एटने ते प्रश्न एक तमाय तीन एम नायक आते एक गन ने इतिंग ऐतर तम मी इतिंग ऐ मी नो न मम्म क्या ने कांता वो मी कांता वांटू इधर � पंतीय बेदिनों आ किए नहीं कहते हमारे मामले काल पना कराने मंगता करने उर्तीय समिति पैतृंग विशेषिंग मामा हितान ने मातूला तीया ना में अधास खानतावो में खानतावां बीमा पमना की साम खानतावां इंटर तरक अवकाश या किला ना किए नहीं कहने वाई में उर्तीय समिति हेमनेतन देशपाल ना पाक्ष खाले आते से एवा पुरुष मोली का आवकाश विधि का तो तमाही हाथी लती है ने ये तो कोटे एवा के थैंग वाला कांता वांट में मुकदमा देंगे आवकाश हाथी ना वाकी आने निकाल पीरमी गोड़ा की तरह किन्ना वाकी निकाल निवे ही नहीं इतना तो ये ना बाला अधिकारी खाओ द वैदगत मोना अधास द वैदगत वाके देवल मैं वाके देवल आपी मांगिता ने नीतिया नीति विधि हट अरे मैं नेतात आपी ये वाटे हैड गहिला दिए ना इतने मैं वाके आवकाश वाला गहनों उन्टे अविल्ला में दं अनित प्रश्न तमाई दं ये वाके गहनों गहनों ये मनी सामाई क्या ने आनान्यता वे निसा वेन मैं लिंगी कहीं संयंग ये वा ये वा ये वात दिए � मैं पासो 
अदास प्रगति जनतापालनमेंटीतू <laughs> स्त्री संबंधी विशेष वामांशिक व्यापार मगे व्यापार व्यापार साकार मानसिक प्रश्न ये प्रधान संप्रदाय के माते उन्हें पांती आरक्षण लिया था मैं अपने कारण दोनों की निकल तो पांती ये तुल पांती ये तुल पांती ये बेदान डे बहार की है ना मैं माते ये निकल ना मुझ पांती ये ऐतवा से मैं पांती ये अभ्यंतरे बिजल ही नहीं पांती ये तुल जाति इन्हा से स्त्री पुरुष वासे तुल वासे निवागे विविध कर ला पंती संकल्प ऐ कर गए ना पंती आरक्षण ऐ कर कतार करा इतनी 
පන්ති අරගලය කරන්න ඕන පන්ති අතරින් විතරක් නෙමෙයි පන්තිය තුනක් පන්ති අරගලය කරන්න ඕන මෙතර එහෙම කියන්නේ ආ හලෝ හලෝ මාර संविधान प्रश्न सा संविधान संविधान विशेष मठ मत अभी विशाल अरगल पोलिटेक्स गार्मेंट फैक्टरी विशेष पक्ष विशाल उत्साह कर लाग्रहण कर ला समित हदल कम अटसीपार बंद हुआ अभी स्त्री सहोद गोडा अपे देश पालन अदास दिन उत्साहन उत्साह अवसानी विशेष वर्धने तो ये वाके तमाई उर्ती समिति वाला तो उर्ती समिति वाला क्या कारी इंटा अभी मैं आवृत्ति है क्या वाला बाद इन्होंने नाय करते गांड 
ඒවගේම ශ්‍රී සහෝදර ළඟවත් ඒ මට්ටමෙන් දියුණු කරලා සංවිධානය ගත කිරීමේ අවශ්‍යතාවයක් තියෙනවා. එතනදී ඒ ශ්‍රී ස්වයත්ත බලවේගයක් වශයෙන් සංවිධානය කරනවා කියන එකෙන් අදහස් වෙන්නේ ස්ත්‍රී දේශපාලන වශයෙන් ධනපති විරෝධී දේශපාලනය තුල ගොනු කරලා ගන්න එකයි කියන එකයි මම හිතන්නේ ඒ කාර්යය කරන්න හැකියාවක් නැතිකම නෙමෙයි අපේ මේ විශේෂයෙන් වමේ සහෝදරුන්ගේ ඒ පිළිබඳව තියෙන උනන්දුවා හා අවබෝධයේ සීමාවන් තියෙනවයි කියන එකයි මගේ අදහස මම හිතන්නේ ඒ ගැන වඩා විස්තරාත්මක වෙනම සාකච්ඡා කළ යුතු ප්‍රශ්නයක් ट अभियोगिकेशन इंग्रेसी संविधान දීල් සෞදරයාගේ වෘත්තීය සමිතිය මගින් දැන් ද නීල් සෞදරයා මෙතන නමුත් මට කියන්න පුළුවන් ඒක අපිට කරන්න පුළුවන් කොහොම හරි මුද්‍රණය කිරීමේ කටයුතු අපිට එක්කෝ නීල් සෞදරයාගේ සමිතිය එහෙම නැත්නම් යම් ප්‍රමාණයකට CMU එකෙන් හරි කරගන්න පුළුවන් මේ එක අදාසක් තියන්නේ දැන් මේ ට්‍රාන්ස්ලේට් මේ කරනවා නම් මේක ඔස්සේ මේ කොටස් දෙකක් තියෙනවා එකක් මේ ෆෙමිනිසම් ෆෝ ද 99% මැනිෆෙස්ටෝ කියලා ඒකේ තියෙනවා තීසිස් 11ක් 11ක් ඔව් හරි මේ ඊටපස්සේ තියෙනවා පෝස්ට් වේස් කියලා ඒ කියන්නේ පොඩි කන්ක්ලූෂන් සෙක්ෂන් එකක් ඒකේ තියෙනවා මේ පොඩි පොඩි විස්තර ඒ කියන්නේ ඔය 11 ට්‍රාන්ස්ලේට් කරගත්තත් අපිට ප්‍රමාණවත් කියලා ඔව් ඒ ඒකෙන් පරක් ගත්තත් කමක් නැහැ ඔව් ඔව් එහෙම කරලා අපිට කොටස් දෙහෙකට ගහන්න පුළුවන් 11 වෙනම ගහනවා ඉතුරු ටික වෙනම ගහන්නත් පුළුවන් ඒක ඉතින් අ ඔව් දෙවෙනි කොටස් තියෙන මම හිතන්නේ ආලට තිබ්බ මේ අර කොමියුනිස්ට් මැනිෆෙස්ටෝ එක සහ මේ තියෙන දේශපාලන ඇතුළේ තිබ්බ පිටු බලය කියන එක. නමුත් එකත් මම හිතන්නේ අපිටත් එකත් හොඳයි. එකත් උදව්වක් වෙයි කියලා. ඔව්. බාර ගන්නවද සහෝදරවරු? පරිවර්තනය? ඒක නෝ හාඩ් කොපි එකේ පරිවර්තනය කරන්න ඕන කොටස दिखाया සමහරයි බොට්ලක් දිග අනිත් ඒ වල වඩා හැබැයි මේ මේ විදිහට බදාගන්න. හරි ඒක මම හිතන්නේ අමාලිට පුළුවන් මේ බෙදන වැඩේ කරන්න. අ අ සම්මිකටත් පිටු 10ක් විතර පුළුවන් වෙයි නේද කරන්න? අ සර් මේ මම මේ කරන්න මේ වයිෆ් ට ප්‍රශ්නයක් තියෙනවා ඉක්කෝ මේ ශ්‍රීවාදී නිසා කතාවේ පොඩ්ඩක් මම අවස්ථාව දෙන්නද මේ ඩොක්ටර් කෙනෙක් සයිකැට්‍රි 
देशपालन वर्ष कथा कर අපේ ලංකාවේ ඉන්න කාන්තාවන් ගේ මේ පෞලත් එක්ක අපේ තියෙන වැලියු සිස්ටම් ඒ දේවල් එක්ක නේද ගොඩක් දේවල් තීරණය වෙන්නේ දැන් අපිට ලොකු වෙනසක් කරන්න වෙනව නම් අපිට තියෙන ලොකුම මේ අවස්ථාව තියෙන දේශපාලනික වශයෙන් නේ ඒ කියන්නේ ඡන්දෙන් නේ දැන් අපිට තීරණයක් ඡන්දෙන් සිද්ධ කරන වෙනස්කමක් නේ ඒ වෙලාවේදී අපේ කාන්තාව ගොඩක් පාවිච්චි කරන්නේ තමන්ගේ ඡන්දය බොහොම පටු දේවල් වල පටු මේ පරමාර්ථ විහා බලාගෙන ඒ ගොඩක් වෙලාවට ට්‍රැක්ෂන් එහෙම නැත්නම් මොන හරි කියන පොඩි මේ දේවල් ඔය වාමාංශික මේ කට්ටිය වුණත් පහුගිය දවස්වල ඡන්ද ව්‍යාපාර වලදී මේ වගේ පොඩි පොඩි ට්‍රික්ස් පාවිච්චි කරනවා දැක්කා මේ මේ අනිත් පක්ෂ ඡන්ද ගන්න විදිහ දැකලා මේ ඒ වගේ මේ අපි කාන්තාව බල ගන්නවා කියන එක අපි දැන් දේශපාලනික වශයෙන් මෙහෙම කතා කරාට आध्यापनिक वशे नगमिक सांस्कृति पशु का क्रियात्मकिया साहद <laughs> 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 पिन्न कांता साउदरु रुको पितरा देने पीर भी साउदरु उन तत्त्व नहीं ला विशेष इन नौयती ये न कांता व साहलंका वे देशपाल ने साह बुर्तीय समिति में वही तीन गेटलो अभी देन क्या न पुलांग ये बुर्तीय समिति साउदरु उन तत्त्व तो कोटे लटा में का फेस कराने पुलांग में प्रश्न है तमारा ये वो दान्य මේ ෆෝරම් එකෙන් මුණ ගැහීම හරහා ඕ වෙනත් ක්‍රමයකට කරන්න පුළුවන්. අ ඉන්දිකා එන්න හැමදාම මේ සාකච්ඡා වලට. ඔව් හරිම මේ වැඩකට මේ මිතර දෙන්න ගෙදර බලා ගන්න කියලා. මේ මොකද මේ මම සයිකැට් ෆීල්ඩ් එකේ නිසා මට ගොඩක් මේ හස්බන්ඩ් ගේ දේවල් මේ ෆීල් වෙනවා. එයාගේ සෝෂල් සයන්ස් පැත්තෙන් फीमेल मेडिकल स्टूडेंट सांप्रदायिकला अमाली सहोदरी 
තම මේ අර මතු කරපු අදහසට කියනවා නම් දැන් මම හිතන්නේ තිතිත් ගෙන් උත්සාහ කරේ මේ කාන්තාව මේ වගේ සාම්ප්‍රදායික වෙලා තියෙන්නේ මොකද මේ තියෙන දැන් ආගමික එතකොට සංස්කෘතික අධ්‍යාපනය මේ සියලුම දේවල් මේ පවතින සමාජ ක්‍රමය संस्कृति अद्यापन प्रतिनिर्माणी प्रश्न पक्षाइक वर्क मंगिता सह अभियोग लांग्वेज <laughs> समरूपतालुदेहरी डोरिंग विक्रम सिंह द सेलिन अपेर रद विवियन गुनार्दन द कुसुमा गुनार्दन द वया यानादी वशेन अतिशयन विशाल कांताओं परिसर को सूर्यमल व्यापारे वटा काटे तो कल दिन इतिहास है वहीं तने पुलसर आगे पुतकों का पुड़ना मांगिता नहीं थी है ना 
सहभागी <laughs> क्रमाकूल नेतृत्वर थैंक यू